Hello everybody, welcome back now to the second part of our first part look at the empires of Eurasia. And we begin today by taking a look at what is arguably the greatest of the empires, that being Persia. Persia, the great unifier. Now we don't always get that view of Persian history here in the West. After all, the nation of Iran has been, let's say, in a complicated relationship with the United States for the past 40 years. And Iran is the nation uh, founded upon the history of ancient Persia. Or maybe it's because the Greeks, you know, the Greeks, they had their run-ins with uh, Persia as well on two occasions, famously in the ancient world. They fended off Persian invasions of their Greek homeland. And when they got around to writing, oh, the histories of it, you can bet that they didn't uh, sing too nice a song about the Persian Empire. And it was that Greek historical tradition that held sway in the uh, West, uh, that is, in the historical tradition that we inherited, more or less. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, Persia has uh, in need, I think, of a better public relations uh, perhaps outside of, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the land of, of, of Iran and uh, beyond the uh, more familiar uh, boundaries of its own history. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there's no denying uh, that the history of Persia is among the storied uh, histories of the ancient world. And so we start today by getting our minds around what I'm calling here Persia, the great unifier, newcomers in an old world. And I say newcomers because although uh, we recognize today Iran, or uh, sometimes uh, even as it's still called Persia, uh, as being, you know, located in that familiar region uh, between the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf. Let's take a look at the map here. Uh, the Caspian Sea to the north and the Persian Col Gulf to the south. That this region in between, which makes up the modern day state of Iran uh, and which has been the uh, basic uh, homeland of the Persian people since ancient times, that they themselves, it pays to remember, that is the Persians themselves, were uh, newcomers in an older world. And by older world, we think of the tradition of Mesopotamia here. We saw the first great civilizations of Sumer in southern Mesopotamia going back to the mid-3000s BCE. Well, when you consider that Persia will become a recognizable uh, unified kingdom only uh, in, let's say, the 500s BCE. We think, gee, that 500s, that's a long time ago. It is, it's 2,500 years ago. But by that time, that is to say, by the time the Persians became their own sort of unified political power, uh, this region had already seen 3,000 years. Let me get my cursor over here. 3,000 years of political history. So that's why we say newcomers in an old world. And uh, the truth of the matter is that we've already looked at the same wellspring of migration that will bring the Persians to prominence, that being the Proto-Indo-European uh, or Pi-speaking migration. We'll get back to that in just a second. Uh, but first, let's remind ourselves that it was up in this region above the Black Sea, uh, what we call the Northern Steppes of Asia, that the various language communities that we clustered together under the rubric of Pi speakers, Proto-Indo-European speakers, that they had already made their mark during the Bronze Age here in what becomes the Greek mainland and also here in what we call Anatolia or Asia Minor, uh, with the Hittite Empire, so both the, the, the Greeks and the Hittites being two of those Proto-Indo-European speaking peoples that established new kingdoms in faraway lands. 
Uh, and that was just the, the beginning of it, because if you recall from our, our lecture, that those migrations continued farther westward, as well as southern and eastward, uh, what we call the Indo-Aryan migrations were a kind of subset of that larger Pi-speaking migration of peoples. Uh, the uh, pioneers who will, in effect, create the pioneers of that migration who will create uh, a new state here in what is now northern India, uh, but also here in what becomes Persia. Uh, so this uh, story of language migration has many arteries of migration, settlement, kingdom building, whether it be the Bronze Age Greeks or the Hittites, or now the folks we're looking at, those we call Persians, who will establish their own kingdom in this land uh, that has ever since been their homeland, uh, but which originally saw them in an old world. There, that was a lot to throw at you, and I hope I didn't lose you, but some of that at least should be familiar from the earlier lecture. Uh, and uh, if so, we shouldn't have any problem moving forward. Yeah, they came as herdsmen and horse breeders, just like all pie speakers. Those who settled in Greece, those who settled in Anatolia, those who will settle in northern India. They came as conquerors, as soldiers, as herders, as horsemen. They farmed, they raised uh, herds, uh, they fought. They were a force to be reckoned with. And the region that they settled, they called Fars. Fars was to become the foundation of the future Persian Empire. And if we look at the modern day map of Iran, we can see that Fars here in the southwest corner was the kind of nucleus of the kingdom that would become Persia. It was from that homeland, in other words, that the Persian glory would emerge. And if we take a look at it, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the Central Valley of California, that is Fars, because there is not only a valley, but a valley rimmed by uh, mountains uh, that themselves provide basically the life-giving quality to the valley. Look, if it wasn't for the Sierra Nevadas, nobody would be farming in the Central Valley of California. It's not from rainfall. As we know, California is often a very dry state as measured by rainfall, annual rainfall, uh, just as Fars was as well. Uh, a very interesting landscape of, of mountain ranges surrounding fertile valleys, but those valleys gain their fertility, as does the Central Valley of California, from the runoff of the, uh, the mountains, the snow-capped mountains. Uh, and so it was that sort of, you know, dependence, uh, kind of a knife's edge often, uh, because in dry years, you didn't get the runoff, you didn't get the crops. You know, uh, not to mention the stark extremes of seasonal weather, you know, searing hot summers, brutally cold winters. Um, that, in that sense, different than the Mediterranean climate of, of California. Yeah, we, we have pretty hot summers, uh, but, uh, you know, not the kind of winters that you would get in far. So all of that was enough for Cyrus, the great Persian uh, king, to claim that growing up there, was good for breeding fighting men. You had to be tough to survive in Fars. Um, and maybe that's true. The cliff walls themselves became a canvas for great carvings, carvings into rock that depicted the imperial greatness of Persia, as well as home to the tombs of emperors. And we'll see lots of examples of that, beginning with this image, where you see the uh, Persian uh, stonemasons and, and sculptors who scaled those walls and into the wall face, the cliffside uh, itself, the story of the Persian, the rise of the Persian kings could then be told. You know, I'm thinking, uh, what, maybe Mount Rushmore or something like that. You know, this idea that empires, they like to leave behind signatures. And what better, more lasting signature than to carve it straight into the rock? 
uh, and they were warriors. And before they ever became famous, they helped with others to defeat more powerful uh, foes like the Assyrians who ruled much of Mesopotamia for centuries. The Persians were a kind of supporting player in the overthrow of the Assyrians. Uh, if we look back at the language uh, and we see they called themselves Ario, which was a Proto-Indo-European word meaning a Lord, a Proto-Indo-European word meaning Lord, a word that is today Ario, is today the foundation of modern Iran. It's where we get the name Iran, but also Ireland. And uh, listen, you wouldn't associate maybe uh, the Emerald Isle, you know, with the hard fought battles of the Asian plateau, you know, uh, of, of Fars, uh, but they do have a kind of connection. And the connection is that language connection that comes through the Pi speaking migration. Uh, Iran, Ire come from the same Proto-Indo-European word. Uh, not necessarily a lot else in common off the top, uh, you know, you would think of between Ireland and Iran, but like a fingerprint left behind, you know, the, the words uh, connect to language, language connects to migration. Uh, and we can trace that migration backwards through history. You know, it's not that different. Again, thinking about California, uh, you think of English, being spoken every once in a while Californians will get uppity and they'll want a, a ballot proposition declaring English to be the official language of California well okay whatever but uh, let's remember English does not come from California it was English speaking people instead who brought the language with them and if we follow them backwards in their migration across the North American continent from there across the cold Atlantic Ocean and uh, to England, we still wouldn't be quite home because the English language itself, being a Germanic language, would migrate then back to Central Europe and from Central Europe to the Pi speaking homeland of the Northern Asian steppes. And so, yeah, kind of like fingerprints, you can follow them, you know, through history and trace the speakers of those languages and the places from which they come. And that's what makes uh, the Persians so interesting is because they were part of that large language migration that we've been looking at uh, in this part of the course. Eventually, they built their own royal dynasty there in Fars, the powerful family known as the Achaemenid, named for Achaemenes, the, the patriarch of the family, uh, the family which will produce Cyrus, uh, the first of the great Persian uh, king uh, slash emperor figures who will come to power in 559. There's Cyrus. Uh, that's the, the, the Greek translation, of, or I should say English via Greek translation of uh, his name in uh, Persian, uh, or I should say Farsi. Remember the, the region was Fars. The language is Farsi was Kurosh, uh, Cyrus, the prince of Fars, united the scattered tribes of Iran and founded the Persian Empire in 559. So call him Kurosh, call him Cyrus. You're talking about the first of the great Persian unifiers. An empire that was unprecedented in its size. That's what's so remarkable. As we begin with Cyrus, we see a dynasty emerge a dynasty that lay on the margins of the old Mesopotamian empires. And, and look, chronology is key here because if Cyrus is living in the 500s, you know, his, his founding date is 559 for the first unified uh, Persia, first kingdom of Persia, 559. Already by then, 3,000 years of imperial history in nearby Mesopotamia. Uh, which was, you know, very old by the time, 3,000 years old by the time that Cyrus uh, comes to power in 559. And thus, on the margins of that old Mesopotamian imperial system, 3,000-year-old system, uh, it will be from there that like a great uh, a trough of culture and tradition and governing that Cyrus will take great advantage of. In fact, it will be famously the armies of Cyrus that conquer Babylon. Babylon, which was the last of the great Mesopotamian kingdom, states 
Here's an artist's depiction of Persia, uh, the Persian army, that is, under Cyrus, arriving at the Ishtar Gate of Babylon. The Persians ended 3,000 years of Mesopotamian kingship and dominance. Cyrus claimed he was now the favorite of Marduk, who was Marduk, the Babylonian god. In other words, the job of the Persians was to defeat their rivals, but not to vanquish them or crush them so that they could not still benefit from the great riches of those now defeated states. Uh, and so one way of doing it, very savvy, very wise, was for Cyrus to claim that he was simply the successor now of the Babylonian king and now the favorite of the Babylonian god Marduk. Just as it would be proclaimed such by the Hebrews, by the way, recall that the Babylonians had destroyed the last uh, great Hebrew kingdom state, had taken the Hebrews into captivity as slaves, and it will be Cyrus who, arriving with his Persians, defeats the Babylonians, liberates the Hebrews, and restores them to their temple in Jerusalem. And he does so in the name of their god, Yahweh which will be enough for the Hebrews to anoint Cyrus as a Messiah figure, a liberator of God's people. Fascinating how these threads basically intertwine with one another. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, there is no nation which so readily adopts foreign customs as the Persians. They have taken the dress of the Medes and in war they wear the Egyptian breastplate. As soon as they hear of any luxury, they instantly make it their own. From a regional kingdom in the forbidding seasonal climates of Fars, now to the building of a great kingdom and from there a great empire. The Persians build an empire of 35 million people ultimately that stretches from Egypt to India. An empire, by the way, built around the grandeur of Persian kings and an aura of the divine, beginning with Cyrus in 559, to his son Cambyses II, his grandson Darius in 522, and Xerxes following, Artaxerxes, in 465. So five generations now following from Cyrus's great accomplishment of uniting the tribes of Iran, the tribes of Persia, into a military and governing juggernaut known as the Persian Empire. O oh man, I am Cyrus, says the inscription, the son of Cambyses. I established the Persian Empire and was king of Asia. Such reads the inscription on the tomb of Cyrus. Now that's not the tomb of Cyrus. That's another one of those remarkable carvings in the side of a Persian cliff. Just to get your bearings here, I give you this inset photo. Get my cursor here. See this little dot, this little spot right here is a person standing on the roadway below looking up to the side of the cliff to this right here, the top part. And, and you can imagine here the Persian rock carvers and masons, stone masons, stone cutters, sculptures had to hang themselves down by way of rope from the top of this mountain cliff to begin the brutal work of peeling away layers of rock and fashioning it all into a great billboard for the Persian Empire. Now, the top part of it you see are the figures themselves. And I'll give you one guess as to which one is Darius, the Persian king. Okay, time's up. That would be, get my cursor back here. That would be this man, the largest in the picture, just like in the old Mesopotamian frames where the Lugal or great man or big man was the one inscribed as king. Well, there's no missing it here because Darius is the biggest there. And in case you didn't get it from that, then you would notice him standing with his foot on the body of a prone rival. In fact, that's who all these figures are in the, in the uh, uh, carving. These are all 
uh, former rivals, now subordinates of the Persians, now clients or subjects of the Persians, bringing gifts and paying respect to Darius. But that wasn't all, because you also get here inscribed in the face of the rock a trilingual inscription that is in three different languages including old persian the first ever to be written uh, that is old persian to be written they had their own script now borrowed from mesopotamia the ancient cuneiform they simply as the hittites had done another indo-european speaking people converted the written script into their own language of a Persian written script. A different image of Darius shown on a throne holding a scepter and a vessel. Darius with his long square beard tightly braided and high flat top crown becomes the basic signature now of the Persian kings. And to the left here the tomb of Xerxes, his son, famous as the leader of the Persian forces that invaded Greece. Such memorable battles as Thermopylae and Salamis uh, in those two wars against the Greeks. Again, carved into the rock, a kind of royal uh, tomb uh, that would take its place uh, among the great monuments of Persian kinghood. Listen to the title here. The great king, king of kings, king of countries, containing all kinds of men, king in this great earth far and wide, king in Persia. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't scrimp on the titles, did they? They got the full value of now uh, the great imperial boast of Persia to be the ruler's of Asia, the king of kings. That was the calling card of Persia. And a remarkable cultural synthesis, no doubt. Um, this wasn't just a bunch of cowboys from the plains of Fars riding their horses off the range, you know, to conquer uh, the local towns. No, this was a juggernaut, an imperial juggernaut of of, of military dominance, yes, but also cultural synthesis. They gained not by crushing their enemies, but by absorbing their enemies. The torso of this statue of Darius, a headless uh, relic, you might say, from the past of Darius the Great, typifies the multinational character of the Persian Empire. The costume is purely Persian, but the statue base, if you look below here, the statue base, the pedestal, contains uh, an Egyptian iconography known as the cartouche, that is a hieroglyphic kind of coat of arms of the ruler borrowed from Egypt now combined with the Persian figure to suggest the unification of the ancient land of the Nile bound together now with the interests of Persia. Familiar motif here, the bull and the lion doing battle in this Persian image, one of the most famous motifs is that of a lion attacking a bull. The lion character, the bull character, they had been used throughout time in Mesopotamia and elsewhere, symbols of fertility, symbols of royal strength. Well, here it's thought they were being used by the Persians as symbols of the seasons, the spring equinox, the defeat of winter by the spring equinox. Both animals were important symbols in all the major empires of the ancient East. Here we have a wall carving, uh, what we call a, a bas-relief carving. Two people shown striding together. They are the Medes on the one hand with the rounded hat, who are cousins of the Persians, Proto-Indo-speaking European cousins. They had been both allies and rivals of one another at different times. Once the Medes ruled the Persians and together they had defeated the Assyrians. But in 550 BCE, Cyrus's army conquered the Medes and lay claim to imperial rule. And yet here they are now, once again, depicted as friends. And most spectacular uh, of all their constructed monuments was their royal and ceremonial capital of Persepolis. The ancient capital of Persepolis, located in Fars, was one of four capitals of the sprawling Persian Empire. Standing atop a 40-foot high man-made terrace foundation, which you can just see here in this aerial view, 
a 40 foot high man-made uh, terraced foundation was the city of Persepolis. The royal compound was built beginning around 520 BCE during Darius's reign. It was a showcase for the empire's staggering wealth with grand architecture, including a treasury and three palaces adorned with extravagant works of silver and gold, and glazed brick and extensive relief sculptures, such as the one you're looking at here now, which shows or portrays the envoys with their offerings for the king. They appear to be walking up one of the great staircases to be received by the Persian king. And anyone entering the palace uh, complex at Persepolis had to pass through this monumental gate known as the Gate of All Lands. Strong Assyrian influence and Mesopotamian influence is seen here in this architecture, which shows, and you can still see them after 2,500 years, the Lamassu figures, that is uh, the hybrid uh, human and animal figures, the body of a bull, the wings of an eagle, and the head of a man. Uh, the Persians had lifted that right out of the script of ancient Mesopotamia, and particularly the, the Assyrian Empire. Uh, they were deity figures in Mesopotamia. They guarded the city. They, they guarded the gates. And so the Persians simply borrowed them and imprinted them here in their own royal capital of Persepolis. Well, here's what it might have looked like, according to the artist's perception of it uh, in its time, in its glory. The vast staircases, the people of all lands coming to pay tribute, the great royal receiving halls and palaces, oh, the great gates. I mean, they had it all there. I want you to look in particular here at this particular gate because look what we see in the ruins left behind. You know, it was Alexander the Great who uh, basically laid waste to Persepolis. It was payback, he said, for the Persia's, Persians' invasion of Greece over a century earlier. Uh, you know what they say about paybacks, but gosh, even what was left with the gates and the tall columns and the great staircases with their carved figure. Yeah, you, you can really get a sense of what the place must have looked like in its heyday. And it was meant to impress. Uh, you don't make the kind of boasts that the Persian kings did uh, unless you could back it up, you know, with a kind of grandeur, splendor, splendor and, and sheer size and scale of their, uh, their ancient capital, Persepolis. Take a look at a few more images. Some of the gates left behind, framed doorways, Mythic figures like the griffin here, wings of an eagle, the body of a lion atop one of the column pieces. Persian, uh, uh, there's another figure here, uh, a stone bull's head. Persian soldiers uh, always given great display and honor with their braided uh, and carefully sculpted beards and, and hair. And there's a, a ground view of the great foundation, again, 40 feet high, upon which Persepolis itself was constructed. So all of this artwork incorporated uh, various themes and motifs and designs from the traditional Mesopotamian, Greek, and Egyptian works. An empire built certainly on military dominance, as all great empires have been in history. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, the Persian king's royal guard was never allowed to fall but below the number, the constant number of 10,000 immortals, the hand-picked soldiers who were the pride of the Persian army. They wore colorful tunics and cloth headdresses and were the elite of the 150,000 soldiers standing army that comprised the Persian military. More honor being paid to the military figures. But notice also here the Zoroastrian symbol, the religious symbol flanked on either end by the Lamassu figures, that is the um, hybrid uh, human and uh, bull, sometimes lion. Here it looks like lion, a lion's tail. 
uh, and uh, wings of an eagle. Those hybrid figures borrowed from Mesopotamia guarding the Zoroastrian religious tradition now uh, of the Persian past. You know, that blending of, of religion and, and military symbols take out a dollar bill sometime. You know, George Washington, a general, the words, in God we trust, you know, the evocation of some divine uh, pleasure. This is a this is a tradition of empires that goes back to the very first empires of history. Persian troops carried iron weapons and fought both as cavalry and as foot soldiers, as infantry. Again, these lovely glazed brick portraits here, profile portraits of a Persian soldier carrying his spear, typically uh, armed with a spear, also a bow and a quiver of arrows. Perhaps the most familiar weapon was the powerful bows used by the Persian soldiers both on the ground and on horseback, but they also carried usually a fighting spear and a short sword for close quarter uh, combat along sometimes uh, with a shield. Oh, I meant to read the caption to your offered peace and friendship to defeated peoples and enlisted uh, foreign soldiers. Yeah, again, the idea wasn't just destroying enemies as much as it was subjugating them and trying to pull them into service. So lots of foreign troops marched along with the Persian soldiers. But it wasn't just military strength. You know, supposedly uh, Genghis Khan, who comes later in history, Genghis Khan is said to have remarked, you can conquer a kingdom on horseback, but you can't govern it that way. At some point, you got to climb off your horse. You got to figure out the routines of administration and law. And, uh, you know, the Persians excelled in that area too, borrowing as they did from the broad palette of ancient Mesopotamian and Egyptian and even Greek systems of government, governance. The Persians invested and all the necessary support structures and infrastructure and engineering and commerce and administration to not only make this empire big, but to keep it being effectively governed. This represented enormous logistical challenges after all. Communication alone would have been very difficult, you know, over thousands of miles. Well, here's what the Persians did. They broke their empire down into administrative units called satrapies and each one was headed up by a satrap by a governor a ruling governor who was loyal only to the person of the the persian king and emperor um, and they kept in contact if there were laws to be passed or taxes to be levied or military reinforcements to be supplied they kept in close contact over thousands of miles this before the age of satellite communications. This before the age of even the electric telegraph. How did they do it? Well, the Persians maintained a royal road that stretched 1,700 miles from their administrative capital of Susa here in Fars, right across the heart of Mesopotamia and Syria, across Anatolia, into the wealthy Greek city-states of Western Anatolia. That is, they built roads. The Royal Road, most famously, stretched 1,700 miles, and engineers constructed it in a hard-packed gravel surface to make the road more durable in all weather. It could drain water in the rainy seasons, but was packed hard for horses and caravans and travelers. Post stations established every 14 miles were fresh horses, uh, carrying couriers could cover the entire length in one week's time. Think, uh, you know, Pony Express here. According to Herodotus, the Greek historian, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night could stop the Persian couriers. It only took about a week to travel the 1,700 uh, uh, miles of the entire length of the Royal Road. Nothing mortal travels as fast as the royal messengers proclaimed another popular saying. So if you had any problems in any of the outlying provinces, you could get message quickly, you could return messages, you could send men and supplies as needed to keep the thing effectively going. A uniform law code, a system of coinage, 
and even a standardized system of weights and measures, well, that all kept the empire going as well. Here's the famous gold coin, the Persian gold coin known as the Derek after Darius, whose image was imprinted on the coin of remarkably high quality, by the way, was this coin, a purity assessed at times upwards of 95% gold was this coin. The Derek uh, was minted from gold found in Greece, uh, in that is in Western Anatolia, uh, in the kingdom of Lydia, whose fabled King Midas once was said to turn everything to gold just by the touch of his finger. Well, the Persians were certainly attracted to gold and they were able to take a lot of that Lydian gold and mint it now into their own coinage used widely as a currency. So um, common was it that even the Hebrews in their scriptural tellings in the Hebrew Bible mentioned the Persian Derek coin. Great engineers, you know, there was a, a legend that said that Persian soldiers could walk on water. Well, they could if the engineers built them a bridge, uh, such as the famed pontoon floating bridge across the Hellas, uh, Hellespont, which was the waterway separating uh, Asia Minor from the European mainland. Constructing a bridge built of boats tied together, the Persians were able to march across the Hellespont uh, in their two fateful invasions of Greece. Remember, they are defeated on two occasions by the Greeks who rise up in a patriotic defense of their homeland. And thus, Greece represented the kind of terminus point of the Persian Empire in the West, something for which the Greeks never forgave them. <laughs> uh, it was Alexander, as we saw, that basically leveled Persepolis uh, about uh, two and a half centuries later. The Greeks disparaged the Persian cultural influence as well, especially the status given their women. But as we look at Persian women, we see a relatively progressive status. According to one ancient Persian text, may a good ruler, man or woman, reign in both the material and spiritual existences. So say what you want about the Persians, but they weren't nearly as sexist as the Greeks were. The Greeks who tended to hide away their women in the back rooms of the home, uh, the Persians brought their women out front and gave them standing as rulers occasionally, as leaders of homes. According to Zoroastrian texts, female members of the Persian society were allowed to participate in religious ceremonies and sometimes even head the event as priests. Persian women were free to choose their spouse and could own property, which gave them a degree of political influence as well, something unheard of in the Greek world. And Persian dancing girls, well, they were said to cast a spell over all the men who watched them with their movements, their rhythms, their gyrations, sometimes known as whirling girls. Uh, these Persian dancers were fabled far and wide for their hypnotic abilities. Even after the Persian Empire collapsed under the under uh, under the under the onslaught, I should say, of Alexander the Great's campaigns in the 300s BCE, even then the Persian influence endured. Persian cultural influences continued to shape the ancient world, in particular the Persian religious tradition that grew from Zarathustra. The cult of Mithras, for example, was a syncretic form of worship popular during the time of the Roman Empire, which seems to have borrowed from the Persian influences and which in turn had special influence on the early Christian movement as well. Take the seven stages of initiation. Part of the cult of Mithras would be adopted by later Christians in the Roman Catholic form as the seven forms of sacrament, including baptism and communion. Even the Holy Days, the celebration of Holy Days, including December 25th, which traditionally uh, among the Persian was the day of the winter solstice, or as they called it, the birth of the sun, when the daylight hours would grow longer, the temperatures would begin to warm, signaling the onset of spring. 
uh, important calendaring, right, for an agricultural people, but uh, with uh, therefore specific days that would become widely observed. Now, in the later uh, Roman Empire, uh, the birth of the sun, known as the Sol Invictus, was the winter equinox. Uh, but to even later Christians that followed under the Roman influence, December 25th, the birth of the sun would become the birth of the son of God, S-O-N, son of God, in a new Christian calendar. We don't know the date of Jesus's birthday, I'm sorry to say. Uh, there's no Hallmark card, uh, but uh, by tradition, December 25th is that date for the reasons I have just described. Now, the rock carving from ancient Iran showing Mithra, who is the, the, the central figure in the, in the, in the Mithrian cult. The, the figure here in the image in one of those rock carvings from Persia shows Mithra with lines emanating from his head. You see these lines here? Those are rays of light as if the, the power of the sun emerging from this wisdom character known, this sacred wisdom character known as Mithra. You see a similar example here among the Romans. Uh, the cult of Mithra was popular. Uh, the character here slaying a bull, showing his eminence, his power, but also this figure get my cursor under control. This little figure right here with the rays of light emanating uh, from his head as well. Again, for the Romans, the unconquered sun. Um, we think of later Christian figures as having a halo around their head. Uh, all of this coming now from the origins of the Persians. But, you know, if you look at, you know, suggesting enlightenment or divine aura, if you look at this character, it might look familiar to you, right? If you think of a certain statue that stands on a little island in New York Harbor. Hmm, yeah, the Statue of Liberty, right? Which was pulled by the founders from whom? From the Romans. Where did the Romans get that image? Well, from the Persians. So from the ancient Persian to the modern American Statue of Liberty. Enduring symbols translated over time. That's the second part now of the first part of our lecture on Eurasian empires. We'll come back here and do China to finish up 